good afternoon or good evening depending on where you are or good morning even sorry um, wherever you are um, just so you're aware um, everybody is muted so they won't be able to um, unmute themselves um, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar feel free to ask them in the chat box um, and make sure that you send it to everyone so that everyone can see the questions and um, at the end, once we're once all the presentations are completed, um, we will um, allow you to ask questions and just raise your hand, um, and I will unmute you so you can ask the questions if you prefer, rather than typing them in. Right, so I think um, I'll begin in just thirty seconds. Okay, so welcome to the uh, webinar. So I'm going to take you through um, a project which is called WAVES and that stands for Widening Access to Virtual Educational Scenarios and specifically this webinar is talking about the toolkit within uh, which was developed as part of that um, project. So hopefully you can all see my slides. So an overview of the presentation. I'm going to introduce the WAVES project itself, the challenges with authoring virtual scenarios and how the project actually aims to address some of those. We also carried out a needs analysis at the beginning of um, the project and we found out what users wanted from virtual scenarios. So I'll touch upon some of that stuff as well. Then we'll go on to the actual toolkit. Now the toolkit is split into two, a knowledge and a technical side. And then we've got an interesting um, talk about keeping it sticky. And then finally, we'll go on to um, the questions and answers, which hopefully you'll all have some great questions. Okay, so waves. WAVES, as I said, stands for um, Widening Access to Virtual Educational Scenarios. This was a project which was funded by the European Commission under the Knowledge Alliance program. And the whole part of uh, purpose of Knowledge Alliance is to uh, bring together higher education and business, so the corporate world, um, different types of businesses, uh, bring them together to provide expertise in delivering teaching or learning and um, projects together. The project was a three-year project which started in January 2016 and finished in December 2018 and we had six partners in that project. Um, St George's was the lead partner, then we had Masarak University, Aristotle University, Karolinska Institute, and then the two business partners were Bayer, which is a large pharmaceutical company, and Carsis. Um, Carsis is a, a authoring software, virtual patient authoring software, and we actually have the CEO of that company um, with us, so that's Martin Adler, who will also be presenting um, after me. And then along with the six partners, we have a wide network of people that we worked with. And one of the asso key associate partners of this project was um, Open Labyrinth. So Open Labyrinth is another uh, virtual scenario authoring software. This is an open source software and it, the development um, of that is led by David Topps who's also presenting today. So what are some of the challenges around virtual scenarios? Hopefully you all know what a virtual scenario is or have seen one. Um, some of the challenges around virtual scenarios is actually understanding the different types. So there are very many different types depending on how you author your virtual scenario and understanding which one might fit the right um, learning activity is very important. Authoring itself, so how do you actually author a virtual scenario? Where do you find the guidelines? Is it just as simple as doing simple multiple choice questions? And as we've mentioned, there's two um, authoring softwares that we used within the project. So one was Carsis and one was Open Labyrinth. But there are so many others. How do you know which software is right for you and for your purpose? And when it comes to authoring a virtual scenario, um, it's also important to think about storytelling and cognition. How are the student learners thinking? Um, you know, does the story actually engage with the um, learners as well? 
and then how and when you might use virtual scenarios is really important as well um, because you want to design them for the light, right learning activity. So with the, with the WAVES project we were trying to provide some good practice on trying to address some of these challenges. So the main aims of the project was to take scenario based learning delivered via virtual scenarios out of the box and this is by combining the skills of academia and business partners so both came together to provide these guidelines. It was to promote a new style of learning and teaching um, so allowing uh, learners to learn in a safe environment. We shared a knowledge on authoring virtual scenarios and provide exemplar scenarios as well. And um, one of the other aims was to impact different professional groups. So a lot of the uh, partners who were involved in this project were um, have created virtual scenarios, but around healthcare and medicine. And we believe that virtual scenarios can actually be um, used in many different disciplines. So this was a really key important part of the project to try and engage with a lot more people and different disciplines. So how did it all start? So the first one of the first activities that we carried out within the project was to actually do a needs analysis. And this was done via an online survey, which we sent out to um, a lot of people in our network, asked them to forward it on to other people. We actually did a couple of focus groups and interviews as well with uh, specific key people. And some of the key findings, as you can see from the map, um, we had quite a wide range of people um, responding to that survey. Um, not a lot in Africa, but we hope, and South America, but we hope to address that. So some of the key findings that we got from this needs analysis was that people wanted more dissemination around virtual scenarios and MOOCs as well. So MOOCs are the massive open online courses. They felt like there wasn't a lot of dissemination or information around it. They wanted guidance on how they might use virtual scenarios as well as authoring them. And also, they didn't have an idea of any products that they could get just off the shelf um, and use them. So they felt like if there was something like that, they would be able to um, use virtual scenarios themselves. So along with the um, needs analysis we kind of analyzed all the results and we split the results up into learner feedback educator feedback as well as technical feedback now here i'm going to focus on the learner and all um, educators feedback from all the feedback we received we carry we um, made end user stories of what typical things both learners and educators wanted so the learners you can see um, here, here are some of the end user stories that they created. Um, as a learner, I would like scenario based learning to be realistic um, around realistic um, problems that they're going to face in the real life. Uh, they want to be engaging with real life situations and also they wanted to learn from the consequences of making a decision um, rather than simply asking them questions. Now educators actually um, had similar responses to their end user stories. They felt like they wanted realistic, authentic um, experiences for their learners. Um, they wanted to get over the barrier of having complex systems and using various different platforms. They wanted to be able to pull all these applications together to make it easier for the learner to um, get to their learning activities and they wanted support and guidance on how to create their virtual scenarios and scenario-based learning. So these were some of the really key end user stories and so the project tried to address this. And some of the two of the main outputs within the project was the toolkit itself. And as I said, mentioned earlier, this is both the knowledge and technical toolkit. And the other side, of the output was the network itself. So collaboration and sharing the knowledge with people. So I'll talk about the network first. So the network firstly was built, um, built from various project partners that we've worked with around virtual scenarios. And some of those projects included EFIP, Cresus, Waves itself, EPBRnet, TAME and Telson. There are many other projects which are currently in place or have been um, in place as well that are part of this network but they're just some of the main ones I wanted to mention. 
Um, so we've got partners from all across the world uh, working with us on virtual scenarios and the way we keep engaged with this community and up to date with this community is through our WAVES website which is free for anyone to have a look at. We generally post our events, latest news and all the outputs from the project on there. Another way is using a annual newsletter which we send out to the community. We have various social media platforms such as LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook um, and YouTube where people can engage and talk to us or even engage with some of the resources. We also have done a number of webinars throughout the project and this is one of our first webinars post uh, project funding. We've carried out face-to-face -face seminars as well and you can see two of the flyers for our face-to-face -face seminars on the slide there. And a new platform which we've adopted recently is the Advanced HE Network. So I'll just talk to you a bit about this network. The Advanced HE um, Connect platform is built for higher education um, institutes. It's kind of like a online social media platform, but for um, education. And you can join our group. Our group is called uh, Virtual Scenarios for Teaching and Training. And the idea is that you'll be able to find information about future events, news um, on that platform, but also engage in discussion with us. So you can see there's a forum where you can engage with discussion, you can make votes, you can respond, or you can actually um, post discussion items yourself as well. Um, so feel free to join that network. The whole idea is that everything is not just given to you via a website where you, where you can't engage and ask questions. So we do encourage you to join that. And um, we'll be sending out the instructions for that at the end of the webinar. So the other output of um, WAVES was the toolkit. And you can see there are various different elements of this toolkit which we'll take you into now. So I'm gonna start off with the knowledge toolkit. The Knowledge Toolkit um, firstly has got exemplar scenarios. So the idea behind this is so people can understand how scenarios can be used for different teaching or learning activities, for group settings or self-directed learning. Uh, you have different types of scenarios. So you have some that are using video, some which are using very simple narrative, um, text narrative. You can use the scenarios for assessment as well. Um, and so there are some examples of those in there. We've provided scenarios in various different languages and different disciplines as well, just to show you that virtual scenarios can be used um, for different disciplines. You can also download some of the scenarios. So some of the selective scenarios can be downloaded as XML files, and you're able to import them into your own systems if they accept the file type. There's also links to other repositories of scenarios which you can um, get to, so such as the EFIP um, repository which we created um, many years ago. Um, so some of these cases may still be of use to people. The other part of the knowledge toolkit is the MOOC, so the Massive Open Online Course. This is a, a course which is um, uh, developed and put onto Futureland. So anybody is welcome to join that course. It's currently running at the moment. So if you follow the link, you're able to join the course and be part of it. The course is split into three weeks. In the first week, you get an introduction of CB, um, scenario based learning, the importance of storytelling, cognition and decision making. In week two, you'll go on to talking about um, virtual scenarios. What are they, the types of virtual scenarios you can have? And also thinking about what it takes to actually plan a virtual scenario. So thinking about things like learning objectives and the style and the learning activity you're gonna use them in. Finally, in week three, we'll go on to technology. So some of the technology you can use. We um, talk about some tips you can um, use to use when you're actually creating virtual scenarios and finally we give you a chance to actually create a virtual scenario yourself. Um, you can actually use the CASA system which has been um, integrated into FutureLearn and um, you can also use other simple tools. The final part of the um, knowledge toolkit is the written documentations and media. So we have written guidelines on installation and maintenance guidelines, and this kind of mirrors what is in the technical guidelines. 
and we also have um, documentation on simple solutions so as mentioned if you don't want to um, invest in a software or you're not quite ready for a software yet there are more simple tools you can use such as PowerPoint or simply paper and pen to create a virtual scenario and this guideline will tell you how you can do that and the there are also video guidelines so we have videos on um, the tips so how you might author a virtual scenario we've got examples of how you integrate systems uh, we have videos on how to create a scenario using open labyrinth or the CASIS platform we've also got videos on the webinar and presentations that we've given um, so that you can re um, see some of those so that's the knowledge toolkit and now pass it on to uh, Martin who's going to talk about the technical toolkit. Thanks Chita. Can you hear me all? Yep. Hey, yeah, fine. Okay, great. So thank you. So um, next slide please. I will talk a little bit of the technical toolkit. The, the main purpose of the technical toolkit was basically to keep lessons learned documented as well as also installation maintenance guidelines which is mainly for open labyrinth open labyrinth can be installed it's an open source software so we created installation maintenance guidelines for this casus is available as software as a service so installation guidelines were not important for that the next big point was integration and um, if there's any software, if um, this is all publicly available through GitHub, it's all open source software. So next slide, please. So the installation and maintenance guidelines. Um, we looked in our evaluation to some of the key issues. So a lot of these issues were around translations or translation to other languages. And particularly, there was very, we found very little support for right to left languages like Arabic. So we wrote guidelines around that as well um, for any kind of other software, but especially for virtual scenario software. Then there were additional modules were built, especially a mobile theme for Open Labyrinth um, for small mobile devices like smartphones. Then there were enhancement about the pathway tool around Open Labyrinth. Then a little bit off the topic from software creation itself is the heuristic evaluation of OLOG3. So this is all about really watching users um, about the usability of a software and create guidelines also for that. So this was especially for Open Labyrinth 3 but the key ideas are very, very easy trans to transfer to other software packages, even not only to virtual scenario software packages. So we wrote a lot of recommendations for improvement of accessibility as well. So accessibility really in, in terms of um, people with disabilities, um, so like uh, things like um, sound or text to speech packages and things like that to improve um, the support. Um, there's a last point. Um, theoretically, there is a standard how virtual scenarios could be exported and imported and we provide uh, a lot of these packages through our portal. So there is a standard for that. It's called the McBiquitous Virtual Patient Standard, which can be also transferred to virtual scenarios. But it's already quite old, so it's from 2010, and the maintenance of the standard is not that good. But anyway, we provide some recommendations and improvement for that standard as well to keep that going. Next slide, please. So integration. Integration is mainly integration of a virtual scenario system into any other learning management platform, LMS it's called. So this might be Moodle or FutureLearn, Canvas, but many, many others. And one standard we particularly approached in our project was the LTI standard. Next slide, please. So why LTI? LTI is a standard for linking applications together. And the main idea around that is that there is a lot of software around and especially there is a bunch of systems around virtual scenarios, but also for any other kind of e-learning. 
So you want to link applications because any of these packages, any of these software packages have their strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons. So if you want to provide a really um, a variable and individual package for your learners, you want to create what we call a virtual learning environment, which is not just one software, but a variety of a lot of other software packages around. So this is why integration of applications make a lot of sense. And we tried that and wrote also guidelines around that, how to link applications through LTI. So a lot of people think this is single sign on. Well, it's kind of, but not 100%. It's single sign on because yes, if you link applications, people don't have to log in again, jumping to another applications, but it's not really single sign on because in a real single sign on environment, you could log in directly in any of these software packages while with LTI, you just link them. So you can jump from one application to the other. Next slide, please. Another package we explored within the Waves project was XAPI. So XAPI is a standard for the usage data. Uh, you all know when you use e-learning, a lot of data is generated, like for answering questions, like jumping from one screen to the other. It's the data which is created is huge, but if it's only stored in each application, it's hard to link the knowledge you get from the usage data. So the main idea behind XAPI is to have a central place for all usage data of all applications used by learners and have it at one place. And by this, you could then really explore how learners proceed and how they get better or detect early if they don't succeed. So we explored a couple of packages. XPR, XAPI is a standard, so you need really applications which implement the standard. So we particularly explored Glassblade, LRS, and another open source um, system and tried how this really work in real life. Next slide, please. So this was all. So again, to summarize this, we tried to document lessons learned. All these lessons learned are available through our WAVES website. We have GitHub repositories, all is open source. We have documents, we have videos, and we have also additional links and resource, and we agreed on we will have meetings also after the project is over. So we will have these links and resources updated regularly. What's brown and sticky? The old children's joke. And yes, it's a stick. So what's the relevance of that? Um, sticky content. And how do you make your content stick with learners? But more importantly, how the heck can you tell if you did? Um, so the idea of sticky content is, um, is not new. Um, it's, it's been written about quite widely. There's this great little book by Chip, Chip and Dan Heath. Um, the important things that we found with um, virtual patient and virtual scenario software was that um, it was very useful as conceptual glue, if you will. And I apologize for mixing my metaphors here, but we'll st stick with the sticky theme. Um, and what, what I mean by conceptual glue was that it was, uh, in a number of projects over the years, it was very useful to use the virtual scenario platform for bringing together different pieces. So we were able to use it to bookend or front end, uh, or introduce the concepts around some high performance mannequin simulation. We were able to use it to back end things and do some follow up. It was very good for pulling together different acti activities. Uh, and as Martin alluded to in his presentation, scenario based learning is, is about using uh, the right tool and the right software and the right um, affordances to, to teach what you need, not trying to do it all within uh, a single platform. And, and this is something where I, I 
um, point, point out the bad behaviors of our, our, our big vendor platforms like Blackboard and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the big guys is that they're all way too vested in the idea of having a monolithic platform that everything you, that you can do everything, that your learners are going to do everything on the platform, that you can track everything within the platform. But we all know that learners don't do sole source. They, 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 they look all over the place for information. It's not the stage and the stage phenomenon where it's just what the teacher tells them. They're going to find multiple sources of information. And there's not been the ability to, to, to track that. So along those lines, how the heck do you know if your content is sticky? Is it making a difference? Is it uh, resonating with the students? And you can do the usual uh, survey things and feedback. The trouble with surveys is that people, you know, the, the business world figured this out a long time ago. People answer surveys in the way that they think they are being helpful to you, not with what they actually think or do. Plus, we're all sick and tired of surveys. This is becoming particularly relevant as we move into sort of the idea of uh, using big data approaches for learning analytics. Um, the idea of precision medicine is certainly taking off in a number of uh, areas in North America and around the world. Uh, the idea of being able to use big data, and it was particularly driven by genomics, but the concept has expanded, using data to push personalized healthcare and from this, there's a similar concept of precision education, i.e. using um, uh, data from learner performance to try and improve the outcomes of the education system. Similar to the adaptive learning that, we've, that we had uh, 20 years ago, but this is taking things you know, up um, several orders of magnitude, using a, a, the plan to use lots and lots of data. And as Martin was alluding to, that's what we've been trying to promote in the WAVES project as well. The problem with doing that is that uh, the few projects that we've been involved in so far, looking at analytics across multiple systems, have been um, a bit of a disaster, to be quite, to be quite honest. That there's been a number of projects where trying to pull data from these from these big systems, and they have absolutely nothing in common. There is no way of pulling the data together. They don't use common identifiers for the players. They don't use common standards. That uh, there's been some fairly notable disasters in terms of uh, big multi-university projects, well funded, and just finding that they don't even have common things like the, 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 the GPA score, which is sort of sacrosanct in North America. Everybody has a GPA of four. Um, and to find that some use a denominator of 4.3. I mean, it's even as simple as that um, that, that, that we do not have in the past from our retrospective, our old data, any kind of commonality. Um, I, I, I predict that we're going to have a number of uh, um, continuing projects which are going to try and uh, scrape old data, and I wish them luck, but I'm not optimistic about their success. So rather than looking backwards, let's move forwards and, uh, and to touch on again some of the points that, that Martin brought up. Um, the idea of being able to integrate your, your applications um, uh, so that you're using the best tool for the best um, activity is one of the key things about the WAVES project. And the uh, LTI uh, protocol for handing off sign-ons between applications is something we certainly found to be very useful. Learners hate having to do multiple logins. This is a better approach. Um, but LTI, a little bit like SCORM, which was this, it's not its predecessor, but a similar attempt where they're trying to integrate uh, platforms, they both have the um, common failing in that what is passed back to the, to the parent, to the calling application, is a single score. It's a single, did, did they complete it and did they pass? A single percentage score, which is kind of like, um, uh, the, the math teacher asking if uh, uh, Johnny did the, 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 the math exam and, and he gets the answer of 32, 42, and, uh, but not knowing really what the question was or, what, or how little Johnny got to that answer. And so this is where, for us, XAPI comes in, the idea of being able to use um, common metrics pulled into an intermediary or a common um, store, the learning records store. 
So in our PIPES project, which is Precision and Health Professions Education Scholarship, a bit of a mouthful, uh, PIPES is easier to remember and more apropos in terms of we are piping things into a central LRS. And this is a project we're doing in Calgary, uh, certainly open to other groups and partners to um, uh, continue with this work. But basically we're combining data from OLAB4, WordPress, Moodle, Open Labyrinth, Drupal, um, the, and using XE API as the common medium. Um, this is looking a lot more promising, but time will tell. A uh, couple of last slides about uh, OLAB4. Uh, so Open Labyrinth, as uh, Shital and Martin have commented on, has been around for a long time. It's been a very um, uh, powerful and useful educational research tool, but it is clunky. Its usability sucks in certain areas, and so we're trying to address this. Um, the focus is still on, on keeping its use and usability for education research. We're moving much more into team-based learning. Um, in healthcare in particular, but in, not, but in many other fields, we're not solo practitioners anymore. We work as teams, um, but our work in trying to assess how teams work together and learn together has been a bit disappointing in that um, it tends to be uh, a bit limited in the amount of data that's captured, so we hope to change that around. Uh, big thing that we're changing with OLAP4 is making it much easier to uh, create scenarios rapidly, and I'll get to that in a second, but it's mostly through the idea of uh, reusable objects and templates. Looking at the data within our servers, we found that certain questions, certain artifacts, certain um, files, etc., were being used over and over again, and yet the architecture of Open Labyrinth didn't make that easy. And so that's something we're doing with all that for, that it's um, the same sort of idea. And if you've used Open Labyrinth with that concept mapping tool, uh, you know, connect the box, et cetera, type in your, your content. But the, um, the idea now is that you can take, you can steal objects from one map or one labyrinth and use them in another. It's, a, it's an extension of the idea of the, um, that MedBig standard, but it's, uh, the analogy I would uh, use would be, when you go to a presentation, you've seen a great presentation, and yet you got to the author, uh, presenter after to say, that was great, can I have a copy of your slides? And they're usually quite happy to do that. You actually don't want to copy their entire presentation. There'll be two or three slides, there'll be pieces of that presentation which are particularly useful. We always rework and reuse the content. And the same is true for virtual scenarios. It's rare to find one which is, uh, which is exactly what you need, but you often find bits, the Lego blocks from other presentations which are usable. And so we've really built on that, making it much easier to take blocks from one and reuse them in another. And uh, so if anybody's interested in trying that out, give us a yell. And I will leave off with that. Thanks, Shita. Thank you. Um, so I will allow participants to unmute themselves now if they wish, um, but feel free to ask us any questions in the chat or um, just unmute yourselves and you can ask us questions. Um, so it's over to you guys, really. Anybody have any questions? So hello. Can hello. You hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I'm Bhatan Sagarishvili from, from Georgia, David Oldiana Medical University. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, you, all the presenters, for the very interesting information. So I have several questions. Uh, the first question is regarding uh, the option of integration into Moodle, for example, this uh, Open Labyrinth, for example. Considering that we at the university, uh, as part of the APBLNet project and by support of St. George's University of London, we are using Open Labyrinth 3, uh, we are using virtual patient um, cases in it. And this direction of integration um, into Moodle uh, sounds very uh, interesting and motivating. So I would like to know more about uh, this, what I mean. Uh, I haven't searched this uh, trend in the, in the um, uh, WAVES research uh, website, so I would like to receive some advice. How can we search more and uh, know more about the, this option? Is it already some instructions there or it is 
uh, we should do something else. The advice would be very helpful. And the second question is about um, very interesting op open labyrinth uh, four. So is it already uh, developed available or it is uh, the under development stage at the moment? So thank you. This is my, these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pata. Uh, Martin, did you want to address the first question about um, where he can find, where Pata sure. can find? Yeah, perfect. Sure. Yes, um, there are um, instructions uh, in our technical toolkit. I think there's even a video about integration in Insight for Open Eleven Three. So you can go to our technical toolkit search if you have any issues. We are happy to support you as well. So you can, you can ask, there is a contact form and there's contact data on the WAVES website as well. But uh, I mean, it's not that complicated. I mean, that's the really the, the, the nice thing about LTI. It's really fairly easy. The only thing, so just in short, what you have to do for uh, integrate both system is um, um, data um, is encoded. So you have a shared secret and you have to define this shared secret as well in the Moodle and in Open Labyrinth or in any other virtual scenario software. And once this shared secret is shared, the rest of the installation is fairly straightforward. You might need administration access um, to the Moodle platform. So you might have to contact your, your, the guys who administrate Moodle, but then it should be straightforward, hopefully. Great, thank you, Pata. I hope that answers the first question. And uh, David, did you want to talk more about Open Lab or OLab Four? Sure, uh, and Pata certainly in terms of exploring uh, the actual learning analytics available from taking the X API approach. Uh, we are currently looking for groups to you know we've developed some infrastructure. Um, this will be more useful when it's put to the test and actually. You know, tested on real world data and with real world learning problems, etc. Um, uh, OLAV 4 is um, so the player has been uh, uh, um, uh, stable for uh, nine months now. It is um, uh, pretty hard to break, and we're comfortable that it's a stable and, uh, and usable platform. And you Pleased to hear that you can import OLAB 3 cases into OLAB 4 and uh, they will largely run as is. So you, you have the backwards compatibility. The, the designer, the, um, the authoring tool for OLAB 4 has taken much longer to uh, get up to speed than we'd hoped. Um, at the Amy conference, we were showing to some key partners that we finally have a workable environment. I would still say it's an alpha stage. It is, uh, there are bits that break easily that uh, I wouldn't recommend using it for production cases yet. Um, but uh, if you, you or anybody in the Waves group is interested in trying out this, um, uh, trying it out and giving us some feedback on the usability of the designer, uh, just email me or email Chatel and she'll pass it on. Um, and uh, we'd like people to start testing and trying trying out this uh, OLAV 4. But I do warn you that it, it doesn't have nearly the features of OLAV 3. The good news is it's also a lot less complicated. It, uh, uh, we've kept it uh, much simpler, as Terry has been exhorting us to do over the years, keep it simple, keep it dumb. And so we've uh, uh, stripped out a lot of the things that really weren't being used before. Thank you. Um, any other questions? No. Um, Martin, would you like to give um, just your experience on uh, creating virtual scenarios because obviously um, CASAS has been around for a while now and you've had a lot of experience um, creating scenarios um, for more than just medicine so did you just want to give a brief um, summary about how your experience? Sure 
I mean, um, yes, indeed, we have a long history, so like 25 years of experience um, on the software, but also on creation of virtual scenarios. And uh, there's definitely something you all should know. I mean, when you start creating your first virtual scenario, like when you start some project in your house or in your apartment, probably the first project is not the best one you will have. So mm -hmm. take the first example as really as a playground and try to get familiar. So this is really doesn't matter which tool you use, whether you use paper and pencil, you use PowerPoint, you use Open Labyrinth, or you use Casus or any other software. Make first a trial. Try to get familiar with the basic features. So I do not talk about advanced features, but really the, the basic features. What you should do is, for really make it work, is though not to take just garbage data, really try to make your first project on like a virtual scenario you really would like to use. So not any artificial things. So make the playground in realistic data, what you want to do. But then once you get familiar, once you got used to the weaknesses and strength of the software or the tool, throw away your first playground, your first example, and then start from scratch. And the second thing, this is really one of the key elements of learning which virtual scenarios is. Don't try to put everything in one virtual scenario. We know now from literature that it's way better to have plenty of virtual scenarios, even if they are short. There is a concept called key feature. So this is basically a virtual scenario focused on the key branching points of this virtual scenario. And, and this is sometimes only like six to seven screens long. So very, very short and could be done by learners in five to 10 <coughs> minutes. So a lot of, a lot of people, when they start thinking in virtual scenarios, they end up putting the entire topic and tons and tons of material into one particular virtual scenario. And this is not the way to go. Virtual scenarios are not meant to teach basic knowledge. They are really meant people get more experience how things really work out in real life. So the main concepts, all the, the structured knowledge this should be ideally be done first, and then you work on virtual scenarios. And so do not try to put anything into one virtual scenario. You end up in virtual scenarios which take two hours to go through, which is very, very frustrating for your learner. So please, these two things I would say are really the, the, the main things. There's a bunch of other things. I mean, in our Casus tutorial, we not only have help pages for how to use Casus technically, but we also have some guidelines and it's also part of the knowledge toolkit of WAVES, some basic lessons learned, how you can make your virtual scenarios better. And I strongly recommend at least before you start creating your own virtual scenarios, read some of these advices and re rethink your strategy. It will save you a lot of time, I promise you. <coughs> that's brilliant advice. Um, that's brilliant advice, Martin. Um, certainly something that I totally agree with. Um, you know, planning is very important. Um, are there any questions on what Martin said or anything else? That's David here. I would certainly echo what Martin said. That's yeah. very much the uh, what we found over the years as well. Well put, Martin. David, you've had a lot of experience with um, using different technologies and things, and even um, looking at the data of uh, virtual scenarios. Did you want to just mention anything about that? Um, one of the things that we found surprisingly interesting, and this 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 um, 
to me it was a like a an eye opener is that feeding back uh to users' performance about how they did compared to their peers is surprisingly effective. And we also we all say that uh, we, we, we respond to data research. Often that's not particularly true. And uh, it is something where um, you have to be careful about. You can't just give people data and expect them to necessarily interpret it. Um, but it is it is a powerful thing, and the the example I it, which converted me to the idea of um, using learner analytics for feedback was was a particularly troubled uh, resident that we had, and who had uh, he he'd gone through so many episodes of remediation um, that he'd become expert at at saying the right things about how he would improve without actually improving. And um, it got to be a little frustrating for all concerned. Um, one of the things that we found was that having them work some, some virtual scenario cases rather than inflicting on yet another patient, the patient suffering, having them do the, do the cases. And then rather than saying, you didn't do that right, you didn't do this right, just showing them, okay, this is what you did. Here's the map and the, you know, the, the path that you took through the, through the case. Here's what your peers typically do. And so implied but not stated criticism, not that you're a bad boy, that you're, you're cheating and rushing your way through the case, et cetera, that just looking and comparing and, and keeping on with that, we actually, um, he, he figured out that, hmm, gaming the system doesn't work. Being an expert or being a remediated student doesn't work. I better do this properly. And it actually, he actually started to change towards good learning uh, uh, and good healthcare principles, basically just by finally being shown this, this is kind of what your peers do. You know, is, is, is it not easier just to, to do it properly rather than trying to always gain the system? So it was, it was, it was very interesting. Yeah, we talk about big data as being, you know, sort of millions and millions of examples. I see it more as providing lots and lots of data back to the individual. The personalized part is important. And that, 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 that was a game changer for us. That's so interesting. And it's, it's so um, valuable to have that kind of data that you can actually feed back to this um, learner. Um, and clearly it's had a positive effect. So that's amazing. Yeah. I, I would add also two other things, which I think is also very important. So integration, not only technically is important, but also integration into what you really need for learning. I mean, it's not so much in business. In business, people usually or, or companies only really do what they know already, what would be useful. We see a lot of times in higher education, especially that brilliant content is created, absolutely awesome content. But then it's really never used because nobody thought how that would really fit into the curriculum, how into the schedule of the learners and stuff like that. And this is really critical. I mean, good learning data, if you only say to your learners, well, use that if you like, um, you get something like three to 5% of your learners will use that. So it's, yeah. it's really a pity. So. Um, this, of course, is, is, is not nice because this is also politically, so you need to, to go higher, higher to people who really uh, care about the curriculum. But this is really important. Otherwise, I would say it's waste of resources and money to spend um, really time on, on, on creating virtual scenarios. Um, so, so this is definitely uh, one more key element. And another thing, also, a lot of people are aware, but some also not is. One of the key lessons we learn in the technical domain um, when we talk about usability is people tell us, you as a technologist, you are not the user. And the same thing is for learning. So the teacher is not the learner. So writing good material, writing good virtual scenarios also means you have to try to get into the role of your learner to really think what could be the, the critical points, what would be the interesting things, where people might get stuck and what they really could learn. And I think so this, um, what we have in technology 
the technology is, is not the user, it's the same thing in learning. You as the teacher, you are not the learner. Try to think, and it's not a mistake to, before you spread out virtual scenarios to a bigger audience, to try them out in a smaller group, like only three, three to five people, letting people try virtual scenarios by just a handful of people, you learn quite a lot, <laughs> I tell you. Um, two very valuable good points there. Um, we actually had a similar um, situation where we introduced a number of uh, virtual scenarios for our students. Um, they were just to complement their learning uh, for the week. So they weren't part of the curriculum, they were just there as optional um, scenarios. And like Martin said, um, we didn't even get three or five percent, we got three or five students actually using them. So, you know, we've seen that. And the second point that you made about teachers um, trying to get into the way the learners are thinking when they're looking at these scenarios, it's very hard sometimes for an expert to understand how students are actually processing this data. Um, we had one um, lecturer who was trying to create a scenario and she just couldn't understand what other options there might be in the scenario because she was like well this is the right way it should only be this way um there wouldn't be any other options there um so yeah having that conversation with um students or even just um looking at what they might do or how what they're thinking when they see see real patients or real situations um trying to note that down and putting it into your scenario is quite key um, I'm going to bring in Andre here because Andre has done a lot of work around uh, virtual scenarios and um, used them within his teaching as well. Andre, did you have a couple of words or some advice even for our, um, our listeners today? Uh, thanks, Sheetal. So, um, yeah, actually, it's difficult to add something to uh, such a brilliant uh, workshop today. So uh, I definitely agree with all the <clears throat> points that uh, uh, Martin and David uh, mentioned. And of course, uh, your introduction was also uh, very helpful, Sheetal. Uh, what I could add here is that, well, uh, my observation when it comes to students is that they expect a lot of technology from virtual patients. They'd like to see virtual reality, uh, they'd like to uh, uh, play with it, uh, and uh, it's important to not get tempted into <clears throat> spending too much time into technology without considering um, the actual merit uh, of uh, uh, educational content for for the students, the learning objectives that can be achieved. Uh, and then when technology is required for that, then of course uh, you can use it, but uh, do not put technology uh, um, at the first place. So this is, this is what I wanted here to add. Yeah, I, to I totally agree with you there. Um, we try to um, introduce a virtual world in the curriculum where students would go into a virtual world called Second Life and actually manage a patient. Um, there was such a big learning curve in terms of learning how to use the software, the interface, that they didn't really get much out of it compared to their normal uh, PBL um, cases. They didn't get much out of it. Um, in fact, they wanted to fly around the island. So, <laughs> you know, it can be distracting sometimes as well. Um, are there any other final questions or comments from anyone? No? Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, thank you both Martin, David and Andre for contributing today. Um, so I'll be sending around an email soon um, just to follow up on this webinar and um, hopefully we'll all speak and see each other very soon. <laughs>